So in light of seeing this incredible amount of information, this data, this biblical data that says that the son did the father's will, the son uh, always submitted to the father. He even spoke the father's words. He didn't come on his own authority. He was always trying to pursue the father's agenda. We have to ask ourselves a question, well, how is, it, how is it that we can understand this, especially in light of the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is at once equal to the Father, and so at the same time, clearly subordinate to the Father? And that's where we have the economic Trinity idea, which uh, I have to inform you has nothing to do with money or the economy or finances. It has to do with how God plans and organizes or administrates salvation. What is the economic trinity? Alistair McGrath writes the following. He says, the essential or imminent trinity can be regarded as an attempt to formulate the Godhead outside the limiting conditions of time and space. The economic trinity is the manner in which the trinity is made known within the economy of salvation. That is to say, in the historical process itself. And so there's only really one trinity, but there are different perspectives to look at it. There's the perspective of how God is in himself or in themselves, as uh, if, if you think about the, the trinity independent of creation and redemption, think of in t- eternity past or, or, or eternity future. And then there's how the trinity functions in the process of salvation. That's the economic trinity. Who does what, in other words? Uh, Essentially, we have to fit all of these subordinationist texts, all these times that Jesus says the Father is greater, into this incarnation window. And then what we have is a temporary subordination as Jesus becomes a human, and then an exaltation where he resumes his co-equality. Does that make sense? So that's the economic trinity solution to the puzzle. But I'm convinced that we are going to have problems with that because of other scriptures. For example, before Christ was born, we read in Ephesians 1, 9, according to his, the Father's purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Notice the word his here is singular. The Father decides In the past, before the birth of Christ, this is talking about his original planning on how salvation would work. The Father decides what Christ is going to do. There's not an equality here. There's still a subordination. Ephesians 3.9 says, The plan of mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, according this is verse 11, according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus. Or 1 Peter 1.20, He, the Son, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Notice the passive voice in the verbs. The son did not foreknow. The son was foreknown. The son did not make himself manifest. The son was made manifest. There is someone else who is superior, who's calling the shots, and the son is following his lead. And that was planned way in the past. What about after his exaltation. Does Jesus resume a co-equal status with the Father? Well, let's look at some of these ideas. First of all, Romans 6.10 says, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. I don't see commentators talking about this much, but I think that is an incredibly short but powerful statement of Christ's current exalted yet dependent status in heaven today, that he lives to God. He's still living for God, for the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 says, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives, not became alive. We're not talking necessarily just about resurrection here, but he lives by the power of God. He goes on living by God's power. He's still dependent even now. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. 
Or 1 Corinthians 11, 3, for the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Again, these are all statements made after his exaltation. These are not in the Gospels. These are written after the fact. Let's look at another category. What about Jesus' mediating role in heaven? Hebrews 7.25 says he is able to save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Romans 8.34, Christ is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now, the right hand is as elevated a place as you can possibly get, but it's still at the right hand. And he's interceding. He's going between the high one and the human race. 1 Timothy 2.5, of course, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And we see this very nicely played out in Revelation 1.1, where we read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants. So God gave him the revelation. Jesus went as a messenger and revealed it to the servants. Even in establishing the kingdom, Jesus is subordinate to the Father. I'm talking about the ultimate consummation of the kingdom, when all the nations come under his influence. Psalm 2.8 is a famous prophecy, oracle. It says, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That is interesting phraseology to me. God is speaking here. We know that from the context of Psalm 2. And he's saying, I, God, will make the nations your, my son, your heritage. Sounds like God's going to do it. Psalm 110.1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Once again, God's calling the shots. He's telling him where to go, where to sit. Matthew chapter 20, verse 23, to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. A staggering statement said by Jesus when they came to him and said, oh, can we, you know, they're trying to call dibs. It's like you're going out to the car and somebody calls shotgun, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're asking, can we sit on your right and your left hand? And I think they sent their mother, which is just like so telling. But <laughs> what does Jesus say? Je Jesus doesn't say you're not qualified or like, hey, that's for Moses or something. You know, he doesn't say anything. He just says, hey, it's above my pay grade, guys. Like, that's the father's job to pick who's in my government. It's not, it's not even his job to pick who would be at his right and his left hand. It's incredible. And what about Hebrews 10, verses 12 to 13? He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, picking up on the Psalms here and applying it to Jesus in a very clear way. So even in bringing about the kingdom, I'm not saying Jesus is not going to do anything, all right? Don't, don't confuse me to, to be saying that. What I'm saying is that even in bringing about the kingdom, Jesus still plays a subordinate role to the Father who decides when the kingdom comes, who decides who's going to do what in the kingdom, and who brings about the submission of the nations to the Son. This is all the Father calling the shots. And then... There's this incredibly, inescapably powerful text in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28, that comments on the eternal state. And it teaches us that the Son is eternally subject to God. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. He delivers the kingdom to God. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. This is just inescapable, as I said before. It's clear that not only before he was born, was the father the one calling the shots, making the plans, working things out according to the counsel of his will. But throughout his entire life, after Jesus was born, as we saw in the Gospel of John, everything he did was what his father wanted him to do. But even once he was exalted, he still depends and is subject to his father 
He plays a mediating role as our high priest. Think about a high priest for a moment. Is a high priest in any, is there any analogy in any religion, whether Judaism or some other religion, where a high priest is equal to the God they're serving? No, that's just not what the word means. That's not the, that's not the figure. That's not what the, the, the figure communicates to us. Um, and then bringing about the kingdom, he's still subordinate. And so he will be after the kingdom has brought everything in subjection, then he hands it over to the Father and he becomes subordinate himself forever. In summary, the Bible contains dozens upon dozens of texts. And look, I'm giving you the abridged version. It's killing me, but I'm giving you the abridged version. (laughs) I have the full version in your paper. It's too long. But if you would like to get a a digital copy of it, it's at restitutio.org. You can find it under articles. But I'm just giving you a sampling of stuff here, okay, of of this, the text that I have. So we've looked at quite a few texts. Anyhow, the economic trinity theory says that only in the trinity's work of redemption do we find functional subordination. Now, some may want to extend the economic trinity to include creation as well. I've seen some people do that. But not only would this be an ad hoc attempt to rescue a theory without biblical warrant in the first place, but also would fail to solve the problem. The Father's eternal plans occurred prior to creation. The Son's heavenly ministry began after his earthly work was done, and the Son's ultimate subjection to the Father will happen after he returns and continue into eternity. Thus, the economic trinity idea is not sufficient to adequately answer the many subordination texts we find in Scripture. Scripture. 